ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It's on there. Okay, we're going to get started here. Welcome to night two of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. Uh, can we just have a quick test up in the balcony to see if the audio, the microphone is working up there? Is the, can someone speak on the microphone? So we did install speakers up there, so help, hopefully that helps with the audio quality. You want to test? Oh, no, up in the balcony, oh. sorry. Thank you. Does someone have the microphone up in the balcony? Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, while we locate that, I'll get through the rest of my opening remarks. Okay, let's settle down. Okay. Tonight, we start on a celebratory note. This year marks the 40th anniversary of Arlington's official sister city relationship with Nagaokakuyo, Japan. <laughs> Arlington's friendship with Nagaokakuyo began in the 1970s. In 1984, the friendship was formalized with the signing of a sister city agreement. And the student exchange program began in 2005 to celebrate our 40th anniversary as sister cities, the mayor of Nagaokakuyo is visiting Arlington and honors us tonight with his presence. And he'll be speaking later tonight. Okay. Now for the more uh, m mundane aspects of the meeting. After our last meeting, I received a couple of questions about why I didn't ask town meeting members who held articles with recommended votes of no action from the consent agenda, whether they were preparing a substitute motion. And the answer is simple, I forgot. So I reached out on Thursday and grilled them or asked them politely, uh, individually, privately instead. And if there's still no subsidiary motion for an article with a recommended vote of no action by the time one of those articles comes up, there will be no scope for debate under that article, and we will proceed directly to a necessary but meaningless vote of, on no action. Uh, in the speaker queue, some of the titles from last week, uh, such as Dr. or Ms., that appeared before the names uh, did not accurately reflect the town meeting members' preferences from previous years. That's my fault as well, as I ran out of time to properly merge the submissions year over year. That's since been corrected, and I apologize to town meeting members who were impacted. Uh, just a reminder that the rules for submitting amendments and substitute motions in advance changed last year, and those rules are still in effect. If you're interested in submitting amendments or substitute motions, please review the town meeting guidelines. You can find a link to those guidelines on the town meeting page under the heading Town Meeting Guidelines and Forms. You click that, it'll expand out, and you'll get the guidelines and a couple of forms. Uh, the goal is that motions submitted in advance are published electronically in the annotated warrant and distributed to the TMM email list by 5 p.m. on the business day before the meeting at which that article comes up. So please allow enough time for review of any motions that you have, since it typically takes me uh, at least a business day uh, to respond with feedback. The guidelines also enumerate other options which do not require review in advance. The meeting last Wednesday ran for about two and a half hours instead of the customary three hours. I don't know if a 10.30 adjournment will be the new normal, but in anticipation, I want to keep the proceedings tight so there's more time for debate and less wasted time. So I'm going to announce the speaker, uh, uh, the speaker from the queue who's recognized as usual, and I'm going to try to remember to also announce the next speaker so that the next speaker is ready to be at the microphone. If you're called as the next speaker, like, like the second speaker, please take a seat somewhere uh, in the front row or stand off to the side if you can uh, so you can get to the microphone quickly so we can cut down on the, uh, uh, the intermittent time between speakers. If this goes well, we'll keep this approach or adjust it. Otherwise, we'll go back to past practice. Uh, similarly, when I call for announcements and resolutions, I'm going to ask that anyone who wishes to speak from the auditorium floor to line up uh, in the center aisle if you have an announcement so we can get through those more quickly. Uh, and if, you're, if you have an announcement from the balcony or the satellite room, uh, you can line up at the microphone in your location. Uh, assuming we've found, have we located the microphone in the balcony yet? Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is the balcony microphone. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I want to remind everyone that seating on the floor of the auditorium 
uh, and the center balcony is reserved for town meeting members and town officials and the mayor of Naga Akakio tonight, of course. Um, if you are not a town meeting member or you do not know what a town meeting member is, please find seating along either of the side wings of the balcony, which are open to the public. Uh, lastly, on a more serious note, uh, I was just informed before tonight's meeting that Marion King, town meeting member from Precinct 1, recently passed away. Our, our thoughts are with Marion's family and friends at this difficult time, so uh, join me in uh, uh, a moment of silence for her. Thank you. And with that, please rise as Ryoko Tanaka performs the Star Spangled Banner. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 1st, 2024, at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a second on Mr. DeCourcy's motion. All those in favor of readjourning at Wednesday, May 1st at 8 p.m., say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. We will, now, we will now take a test vote. Can we bring up the test vote, please? Uh, it should be coming up. Um, OK. Test question is, the combined Number of stars, stripes, and circles on the American and Japanese flags is 64. Press 1 if you think that statement is true. Press 2 if you believe that statement is false. Press 3 to abstain. I was tempted to do it in hexadecimal, but I thought that wouldn't be fair. Okay, can we uh, cycle through the screens for the test vote? <laughs> and the correct answer is yes, if I did my math right when I put the question together moments before the meeting started. It's 50 plus 13 plus one. And while we're waiting for those screens to go by, um, uh, Mr. Tosti reminded me uh, uh, to inform all of you, uh, in case you weren't aware, that uh, we'll be taking up, uh, let's see, which article is that? On Wednesday, um, 
will be taking up Article 45, the appropriation for the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School. Uh, so we will, we will be taking that, or it's up to the meeting to, uh, to allow us to take that out of order. We customarily do. Um, uh, we'll, we'll jump ahead to Article 45, and then we'll return after that to the normal numeric sequence of articles. Did, did we cycle all the way through the, the precincts? Okay. Uh, so next, um, are there any announcements and resolutions? And if folks, if there's multiple, like feel free to, to line up near the front. And we can start with, um, I believe someone was going to introduce our delegation. Um, oh, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Good evening. I'm Salman Chabra, Precinct 2. Um, Greg mentioned earlier the program, the, uh, the exchange program we, we have with our sister city in Japan in Nagako Kakio. Uh, that's, this is a special year. It's 40 years since the inception of the program. And I'd like to acknowledge Dick Smith, a former town meeting member, the late Dick Smith, who was instrumental in forging this bond with our sister city. And 20 years since the initial exchange happened with our students. So first, um, we have up in the, in the balcony up there, 16 students and four chaperones. I'd like to give them a, a warm welcome to Arlington. <laughs> this, to commemorate this special year, the 40th anniversary, we also have the mayor's delegation here. So joining us tonight are Mayor Kengo, Naka Koji, along with five members of his delegation, Tazuko Sharashie, chairman of the city council, Sutomo Kohara, who's the chairman of the French, uh, chair of the Friendship Association, Kenji Shirota, secretary of city council, Eiji Jinden, secretary of mayor, and Sano Toyama, the coordinator. So warm welcome to the delegation, please. Thank you. The, the program is an amazing one. My family, this is our fourth year being a host family, and there's many others out in the crowd that have done this in the past or are doing it currently. And I'll say that it's a, it's a great experience, uh, hope for them, and especially for us, our families. Um, uh, I'd say, um, you know, the program itself um, is led by Joanne Rutenberg, or maybe a round of applause for Joanne. It's an it's a <laughs> exceptional program that she's run. It's jam-packed with activities. The students get to see Arlington, all and around Boston. Um, they visit our schools, local farms. They saw the Sox win on, on a, in walk-off style last night. So they, they get to see a lot of Boston. Um, and then I think for, for me, the most special part is just the, the bond we build with the families, with the students. Um, they're here for 10 days. Days are jam-packed. Weekends are with us, nights are with us. So they, they become part of our family. Um, dinners, playing with our kids, um, lots of questions. They're, they've been really working hard on their English and, and I think this is great for them. And we learn a lot about the Japanese culture. So um, I just want to acknowledge what a special program this is, how, um, how thrilled we are that we can continue this and to the 16 students and four chaperones, Thank you for sharing your culture with us and, and uh, you know, keeping this bond going. With that, I want to introduce um, the mayor, please. Kenji. And just one, one quick note. All those in favor of allowing uh, the mayor of Nagakakio to speak at town meeting, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. Mayor, please. Good evening, everyone here in Arlington. I am Kengo Nakakoji, the mayor of Nagakyo City. I came here to celebrate for this anniversary of the sister city bond between Arlington and Nagakyo. Our friendship started as exchange between citizens 
about 50 years ago. In 1975, Richard Smith, Secretary of the Arlington Town Committee, first visited Nagaokakyo and proposed a sister city agreement. In 1978, Deputy Mayor Matsunobu Nakakoji, actually he is my grandfather, <laughs> signed the sister city promotion statement. I am thrilled to be able to speak at this town meeting today because the relationship has continued since my grandfather's generation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. We began our sister city agreement on September 21st, 1984, and year makes the 40th anniversary. In 2004, a student exchange program studied and visited each other. This year marks the 20th anniversary. Many students from both cities have gained valuable experiences by spending time with host families, interacting with students of the same age, and learning about the culture of their respective countries. Today, I visited Arlington High School with students and saw many smiles and excitement on their faces. I am confident that this program will be a wonderful experience. This is my second time visiting to Arlington. The last time was five years ago. Over the past five years, due to COVID-19 pandemic, we have not been able to visit each other, but I am happy that we have resumed our exchange again. I would like to express my gratitude to everyone who has been involved in this exchange between Arlington and Nagaokyo, including the members of Selectman, the town manager, the superintendent of education, and others. On behalf of the citizens of Nagaokyo, I would like to thank everyone in Arlington for their warm support. I hope that this wonderful relationship will continue for many years to come and continue to my grandchildren's generation and beyond. I look forward to seeing you all in Nagaoka Kyo next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions tonight? Uh, Mr. Foskett? Keeping in mind that I have this large display that it's hard to see behind. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 10. Um, <clears throat> I, I rise to uh, point out to the town meeting that Many of you may recall seeing the array, vast array of flags at the uh, water tower in, in Park Circle uh, in Memorial Day in past years. This is the Flags for Heroes celebration sponsored by the Arlington Rotary Club, or, or Rotary Club of Arlington, I should say, formally. Um, <clears throat> so this season is upon us again, and there is an announcement at the back table as to how you can participate in this program honoring essential workers, volunteers, veterans, friends and family, caregivers, mentors, first responders, and, and um, friends and, and relatives and others who have passed. Um, the donation per flag is $40. All of the funds that are raised in this program go to the Rotary's uh, scholarship program where each year we award three scholarships one to a student at Miniman, one to a student at Arlington High School, and one to a student at Arlington Catholic. So I urge you to please pick up one of these sheets and participate 
in the Flags for Heroes program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, um, are there reports of committees? Mr. Moore? We do. Ms. Deschler? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Okay. All those in favor of taking Article 3 from the table say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Uh, Mr. Moore? Thank you. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the report of the Capital Planning Committee be received. Okay. Do we have a second? We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of receiving the Capital Planning Reports uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed? So received. Are there any other reports of committees? Seeing none. Yes, no, oh. no. Uh, um, Ms. Rowe from the satellite yes, room, go ahead. You. Can we switch over to the satellite room video, please? Thank you very much. Clarissa Rowe, Chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, I would like to put our report forward. Okay, okay do we have a second? Okay, uh, all those in favor of receiving the capital uh, I'm sorry, the uh, um, Community Preservation Community Act, Community Preservation Act uh, Committee report. Thank you. Uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, I assume a piece of paper will materialize in my hand at some point tonight. <laughs> um, okay. Any other reports of committees? Seeing, seeing none. Ms. Deschler? I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a second to lay Article 3 upon the table. Uh, all those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it's unanimous. Article 3 is back on the table. Uh, we resume with Article 14 tonight. Oh, I see a report has materialized. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy or, or um, uh, Mr. Feeney, do you want to lead us off? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Feeney, Town Manager. Uh, we had hoped to request an additional three minutes for this presentation, if possible. Uh, do we have a second for, for an uh, extension to uh, 10 total minutes, was that, Mr. Feeney? Correct. Okay. And we have a second. All those in favor of giving Mr. Feeney 10 minutes for his presentation, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? Uh, it is uh, majority. Uh, Mr. Feeney, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. As town meeting members are likely aware, there have been multiple targeted demonstrations outside of the governor's private residence. Following the demonstrations, there were inquiries from neighbors as to why town officials were allowing this to occur, given that the affected residents live on a network of private ways. However, the town was not in a position to restrict this activity due to the classification of the roads, as they still have to remain open to the public. Uh, Mr. Feeney, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I forgot to do one thing. I I've paused your time. Uh, presentation folks, can we switch over to the speaker queue and clear that so everyone can uh, see when we're resetting the speaker queue and, and hop on it so we have a level playing field here? Okay, can we clear this now? And when, when this screen clears, it means the speaker queue is open and then you can uh, click your handsets to enter the speaker queue. Okay, speaker queue is now open and requests are coming in. Mr. Feeney? Apologies for the interruption, go ahead. No worries. Residents then questioned what else the town could do to help prevent this activity moving forward so they could enjoy peace and quiet in their neighborhood. So we reviewed our existing bylaws to see what tools, if any, would be available to the police department to address neighborhood concerns. Finding no clear, effective means to universally address the concerns, we researched potential new policy proposals. The option presented to the select board, which is now before this esteemed body, was offered as a well-tested measure that could likely provide relief to the residents of the neighborhood, given that the demonstrations have taken place at various times of day. Though this proposal certainly arises from, a, from an experience in a particular location, it aims not to target any specific group, but instead would apply to any person or group of persons targeting one specific residence, and that could be any residence anywhere in town. I will note the governor's team is aware of this proposal, and it is expected the governor would support this measure if town meeting looks upon it favorably. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. DeCourcy. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, as contained in our report, the Select Board voted favorable action on this proposed bylaw by a four to one vote. Mr. Diggins uh, voted in the negative. Um, the Select Board report contains our rationale for our favorable action recommendation. But I just want to repeat some things from there and, and discuss some of the balancing uh, between rights that uh, entered into our decision. Um, so as stated in the report, uh, the proposed bylaw was inserted after receiving inquiries from neighbors. There were a total, since last October 7th, there have been a total of three protests in the neighborhood. And I will say I am a, I, I live in the same neighborhood as the governor. Um, the one thing in common in each protest was that in each instance, the protester gathered in front of the governor's house and targeted her home. Um, as a result of our research and research by town council, we were presented with a bylaw that was identical to one that the Supreme Court um, ruled on in a 1988 decision, Frisbee v. Schultz. Um, and in that case, the court balanced two rights, the balance of free speech and the balance of a right to residential privacy. And the residential privacy that was at play here was the, the privacy of the, the individual who's the target of the protests. And that was deemed to be a significant government interest that when you balance the right to free speech and the right to privacy in front of the targeted individual's home, the right to privacy was favored, trumped the right to free speech. An important aspect of residential privacy is the protection of the unwilling listener. And what the court said is there's simply no right to force speech into the home of an unwilling listener. And it raised an issue known as the captive audience doctrine. Basically what it said is, again, this right to privacy, which we've seen in many other Supreme Court cases, is that within your own home, you shouldn't have to be put in a situation where you're captive, where you don't have a choice whether to listen to the message or not listen to it. You shouldn't be put in a position that leaving your property or coming back to your property um, is limited. And I contrast that to a discussion that we had during the select board hearing. Um, my colleague, Mr. Diggins, talked about a protest that may take place here at Town Hall. And what he said is, if there's a protest at Town Hall, I simply go in another door. I avoid the protest. I'm oblivious to what's happening outside. The point of the right to residential privacy and why we feel this is so important is the person at home who's the target of such a protest doesn't have the same choice. They're captive in their home and they become unwilling listeners. And it's that balance that we believed um, really caused the four of us who voted in favor of this to, to, to say this is a limited exception. It's a limited infringement on free speech rights. And, and why do I say it's limited? Because the court in its wisdom in Frisbee and in several cases after that have basically said the right to privacy in the home and directly in front of the home is superior to, the, to a free speech right for a group that is gathering and targeting the home. And as I said, in each instance, the three protests came in front of the home. Two of the protests came at night, came with flares in, in our report. There were masks on. Um, and anybody at home who was the target of that would have been captive. And I want you just to hold that thought, and, and I'll return to it for, about the captive audience. The other thing about this decision is the right to privacy, in our view, trumps the free speech right for the targeted petitioner at all hours of the day, at, at eight o'clock in the morning, at six o'clock at night, at nine o'clock at night. And for that reason, we would oppose any restriction on time or, or, or any time limitation on, on this, on, on, which we see in one of the um, substitute motions. Of the three protests, one happened at 12 noon, one happened at around six o'clock, and the other one happened about nine o'clock. In every instance, the person in the home was captive. And for that reason, similar to what Brookline did, we believe an outright prohibition is what's necessary. Um, I mentioned earlier about the right to privacy. I also want to mention 
that we heard from several neighbors. And while the neighbors' concerns don't rise to the level of the constitutional concerns of the targeted home, they're still relevant. They're relevant in Boston when they passed their targeted ordinance. They're relevant in Brookline when they passed their ordinance back in their bylaw back in 2004. I've heard from several neighbors after the protest, people who've been put in fear, people wondering what the town can do. And again, this we feel is a limited restriction, but a very important restriction. We ask you to support it. Now, regarding the captive audience, I want to, and, and the issues surrounding fear and harassment of neighbors, I want to show a video that the group that targeted the governor's home in October and again in February posted online following the protests. I want to warn you that the video contains explicit content. Fucking year, you guys didn't even know we were coming to your governor's house. You guys fucking suck, bro. You guys fucking suck. Jesus Christ. I see that our time is, is, is nearly up. Attorney Cunningham is available to discuss the standards that the board followed and the consistency with the Supreme Court decision. Um, you know, we're here to answer any questions and, and we urge you favorable action on this proposed bylaw. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. So, I mean, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that this is a very serious matter on all sides of this issue, as far as constitutional rights, free speech, and the, the rights of residents to live in their homes uh, peacefully. So I want everyone to take this matter very seriously, no matter what side of the debate you're on. And you might be split on this debate because you might have very mixed feelings about this, I'm sure. Many people have. And also, one, one note on, on the law and constitutionality. Um, Mr. Cunningham, correct me if I say anything incorrect or inaccurate here. Uh, the town meeting is not going to decide law, and it's certainly not going to decide the Constitution or what's constitutional or unconstitutional. You may hear opinions tonight. It may be from lawyers about uh, what's constitutional or not. Um, so just keep in mind that unless someone can produce a majority of concurring justices from the United States Supreme Court or a federal court, um, we are not going to decide constitutional matters at town meeting. That's for other venues to decide. But opinions about uh, the history on one side or another of this debate may be presented tonight. So keep that in mind. Um, so. Is that fair, Mr. Cunningham? Okay. Uh, so let's now uh, cut over to the speaker queue, and the first two speakers will take one. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Brazil. We do have some uh, subsidiary motions, and so I will call them up in the order uh, that we will eventually vote on them after debate. But we'll introduce them up front. We'll have debate about uh, the recommended vote of the select board, along with uh, these amendments and one substitute motion. Uh, we'll debate them all together, and then we will vote on them in the same sequence that we're going to present them here. Uh, so I now introduce, uh, I want to bring up, uh, we'll do them in this order, so if you can get ready to speak. Uh, uh, Mr. Benell will introduce his amendment, then Mix Pretzer from the Satellite Room, I believe, will uh, introduce their amendment. Uh, Mr. Lewicki will then introduce an amendment, and then finally Mr. Loretti will introduce a substitute motion. So uh, Mr. Benell, if you can introduce your, uh, your amendment, and if we, can get, if we can present that on the screen uh, as Mr. Benell 
uh, presents his motion and makes his motion. Colin Bennell, Precinct 5. All of us were horrified by the arrival of Nazis in Arlington and then their return. It is hard to feel safe when such people come into our community, but we will not make ourselves safe from Nazis by infringing on the very freedoms they threaten. Therefore, I oppose Article 14. However, if we are going to pass it, we ought to make sure it meets constitutional muster and protects to the degree possible the right to protest. In the debate at the select board, it was stated that the language of Article 14 was taken straight from the ordinance at issue in the Frisbee case. This is true, but incomplete. The court in Frisbee wrote a two-part test into the ordinance, specifically that a protest be both targeting a particular residence and take place before or about the residence. The language change proposed in my amendment brings Article 14 in line with the Supreme Court's decision in Frisbee. Boston and Brookline both included language to this effect in their ordinances in response to Frisbee, which the AG approved. Arlington did not. We include only the second prong of the test, which means we either are relying on a court to rewrite our bylaw, or we are intending to ban all protest anywhere in Arlington near a residence, which is to say, anywhere in Arlington. To be clear, I don't believe that was the intention, but if we insist on passing this article, then the article should be as clear and unambiguous as possible and not rely on courts or our police department to interpret the bylaw to mean something it doesn't actually say. I believe this amendment is necessary. I do not believe it is sufficient. I also support the Pretzer Amendment and or the Loretti Substitute Motion, which incorporates the same, uh, both of which include a time limitation and the Loretti Substitute Motion incorporates the same revision as my amendment. Placing a time limitation on the prohibition, as Boston did, reduces some, but not all, of the potential damage to freedom of speech, which Article 14 does. While I appreciate that the Lewicki Amendment attempts to address the edge case of a tenants protesting their landlord at their own building, as happened recently in Arlington, the unintended consequence is to open multifamily housing to targeted protest with a single tenant's consent while insulating more affluent owners of single family housing from such protest. I don't think it's appropriate to set up a two-tiered system with different rights and protections for residents based on wealth. So while I support the intent, I can't support the amendment itself. But regardless of whether this body chooses to support any, all, or none of these other proposals, it is imperative that the language of our bylaw reflects what the law actually is. So I urge passage of my amendment or the Loretti substitute motion. After considerable thought, however, Regardless of what amendments or substitutes are passed, I will be voting no on the main motion. Throughout the country, the right to protest is under attack. In the Fifth Circuit, which covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, police are being permitted by the courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, to sue an organizer into destitution for the actions of a third party in what is clearly an attempt to ensure that nobody ever protests for racial justice in those states again. In New York City, Boston, and elsewhere, protests at protesters at universities are being arrested, thrown out of campus housing, and suspended or expelled for advocating for foreign policy views that the university administration disfavors. People have peacefully protested at the homes of Supreme Court justices because those justices have ensured that they are entirely insulated from having to encounter any dissent in their professional lives. And in response, activists and elected officials such as Senator Ted Cruz have advocated for the prosecution of these protesters because they do not like the message. Arlington is not, sadly, alone in seeking to restrict the right to protest. Article 14 is being cast as a narrow, unambiguous bylaw that doesn't pose a threat to legitimate protest. It is not. Leaving aside my earlier discussion of the two-part test, even if we fix that oversight, arguments favoring the article assume it will be immediately obvious what protests are targeting a specific residence. What if the protest is marching up and down the governor's street? What if it's targeting the governor, but the protest is in front of a house across the street or three doors down? What if instead of the governor, the protest is targeting someone who lives in an apartment off Arlington Center, and the protest is in Arlington Center, which is a clear public forum? The boundaries of this law are not clear, and that puts the right to speak out in jeopardy. And whether the Supreme Court would prove the legislation or not, that doesn't end the matter. The Supreme Court approves, it has approved, a great many infringements of law and liberty that we properly find appalling. The protests that occurred at Governor Healy's house which prompted this article are frightening. As a queer person with a queer Jewish spouse 
and Jewish, queer, and trans family members, I am not at all casual about Nazi protests in my community. I find them horrifying. But we are not made safer by choosing to make ourselves less free. I urge town meeting to defeat this article and stand up for the right to protest. Mr. Moderator, I move that Article 14 be amended per my previously submitted motion. Okay, we have Thank a motion. You. We have a second. Thank you, Mr. Bunnell. All right, let's hold our let's hold let's hold our applause until the end, please. But not the end of the article, the end of the evening, please. Um, next, we'll so we now have the main motion before us, and we have Mr. Bunnell's amendment uh, before us as well. Uh, Mix Pretzer from the satellite room, please. Can we switch the video over and bring up? Uh, or, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, David Pretzer, Precinct 17. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I as well am definitely you know shocked by what has happened in Arlington. I think. We can all agree that that video was very shocking. My concern is that while I agree that the town can be doing more um, to support you know, residents impacted by those types of protests, uh, the main motion as written is extremely broad, notably broader than either Boston or Brookline's similar motions in restricting um, the ability to protest. And I think even with the Bunnell's amendment, I have uh, severe concerns about the breadth of this. Uh, you know, we, we heard before a lot about, you know, the right to, you know, not be a captive audience in your own home. And I think we can all agree that, you know, flares being used in a dangerous manner is not something that anyone's encouraged, uh, that anyone finds like an appropriate uh, use of public space. Um, but the Bible as written would also ban someone silently holding a sign it would um, ban vigils with a, with a political message. Um, I don't think that this is something that we should be completely banning, even if they're in a residential area or even if they could be interpreted as targeting uh, a home. There's no provision even for town approved events to be exempted. Um, and so I think we should be really careful about it, how we view this as common for people on, uh, on local elections to hold political signs a certain distance from the polling place because uh, you know, it is disallowed to hold them too close to the polling place, which generally means that they're standing in front of someone's home in many cases. And I don't think that's something we should be banning either. I think uh, we currently allow um, commercial speech in residential homes. During the day, it is entirely legal in Arlington for someone to commercially solicit you to like ring your doorbell and try to sell you Girl Scout cookies or an encyclopedia. Uh, we currently allow during the day people to amplify music by a loudspeakers. I don't think that someone silently, silently holding a political sign in the public uh, in the public space should be viewed as more inherently more disruptive or more worthy of restriction than that. And so I believe that if we are going to restrict the right to protest, we should not be restricting it significantly more heavily than other types of speech we permit in town. Um, and I'm concerned um, that, you know, regardless of how this bylaw is enforced, the mere existence of this bylaw will have a chilling effect. We've talked about the uh, very effective and successful tenant protests against landlords that have happened recently in Arlington. Those could be interpreted as, as targeting a specific residence um, and could be uh, chilled or banned under this bylaw. Uh, a, a rally with a, in someone's yard with their permission could run afoul of this bylaw. Uh, as someone who's attempting to show support for a student who has been bullied or, or someone else who, has, um, who needs support from the community could be viewed as violating this bylaw. I, I don't think we want to throw the baby out with the bathwater by banning a wide swath of quiet, respectful political speech based on these horrendous uh, events. I think we already have bylaws on the books in Arlington for, um, for, uh, um, for uh, overly harassing or, um, or, or rude or disruptive behavior and also for blocking roads and, si and sidewalks. Uh, I think most likely the police are capable of enforcing these bylaws to handle situations like, th like this. And if the police need additional specific measures, to handle um, harassing or things that threaten public safety. I'm in favor of specific measures, for example, banning inappropriate use of flares. 
And I think we can, we can pass specific bands, but I think uh, a band that includes quiet, respectful holding of signs and other quiet, non-harassing forms of political sweet, speech 24 hours a day is overly broad. These are tactics that have been used by abolitionist youth groups below the, before the Civil War, through the tactics that are used today by pro-choice activists and environmental activists. I don't think we want Arlington to get a national news for arresting protesters who fail to disperse the way that has been happening on campuses and other locations um, nationwide recently. So, and keep in mind that if this article passes, there will be pressure on the police to enforce it strictly, because if it is enforced against the Nazis, but not against other violators of this bylaw, then the Nazis can turn around and take us to court saying that it was being enforced in a content biased manner. So I think we have to pay a lot of attention to what the literal language of the bylaw says and expect that if this passes, there will be a lot of pressure on the police to enforce whatever the language actually is strictly. And because of that, I, enforce, I encourage you to pass the Bunnell Amendment, my amendment, the Pretzer Amendment, and the Lewick Amendment, and to vote against the main motion if any of those amendments fail to pass. I think all three amendments make important restrictions to this otherwise quite overly broad motion. And I think we owe it to ourselves and future generations to live up to our ideals of liberty and avoid unnecessarily broad restrictions on free speech. I move to amend the main motion with the Pretzer Amendment as previously submitted. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to amend the main motion. We have a second. All those, in, uh, oh, actually, we're, we're just moving it. We're just moving it. Um, okay, thank you. And so next, we will take uh, Mr. Lewicki. So we now have the main motion, the Bunnell Amendment, and the Pretzer Amendment before us. Mr. Lewicki. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. J.P. Lewicki, Precinct 2. Good evening. Um, with my amendment, the intent was to address a situation that does not appear to be covered by the Bunnell Amendment, uh, which is a very good amendment and I support. Um, I'm a resident of Kelwin Manor. Uh, I'm not close enough to have overheard the protest directly, but I know many people who are affected. Uh, so basically, with the Bunnell Amendment, you, it, it properly handles making sure that it, only situations where a house is specifically targeted are addressed. However, with my amendment, um, there are various concerns. Like if you have a tenant protesting their landlord, even if the landlord is not resident at their house, if you want to hold a political rally to support something and to hold signs outside your own residence, well, you're, you're picketing, it's targeted at a house, uh, you, you want to make sure that that sort of thing is still allowed. Uh, and so I felt that the amendment that I've um, suggested helps alleviate some of those concerns that if you kind of have a situation where it's a kind of a voluntarily hosted protest, that it's not, um, not subject to the bylaw. Um, so that's kind of my intent in introducing it. Um, I think too, in terms of thinking about the amendment, I was struck a lot by some comments by Eric Helmuth in the select board deliberations about this. He was discussing how, if the, there was kind of a hypothetical posed, if, if this was kind of, if the politician that he wanted to, pro, that would be uh, potentially protested held important views that he personally disagreed with. And he very eloquently talked about how he would personally take many different protest actions. He'd show up at, outside um, uh, the state house. He would hold various rallies. Um, but he felt that it was important for this kind of civic culture that he wanted to, to be a part of to not actually bring that to the level of the home, that there should be the potential for political officials to have a private home life that's outside the sphere of, um, of politics and to kind of have a little bit of that refuge. So I think I urge you as you're considering this article to consider the kind of civic culture that you would hope to see in Arlington. Do you want to see one where we have a robust um, set of public protests where uh, debate can kind of cover many different topics, where 
all that uh, can take place, then I urge you to kind of look at the amendments that have been proposed to support all the ones that you feel are necessary in order to feel comfortable with the, the, the bylaw, that it won't, um, it won't prevent people from uh, ho voluntarily hosting protests, that if the residential component is only incidental to it, as with the Bunnell Amendment, um, or if you feel that the hours restriction is an important part. So I would, I would urge you to kind of look at the ones that you think are necessary for you to support this, and then also to consider uh, the kind of civic uh, engagement that you'd like to see in, in our community. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, can you make a motion, please? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, you don't have to. I, I move to amend the main motion with my amendment. Okay. We have a, we have a second for um, putting the Lewicki amendment before us. Thank you. So now we have the main motion and then the, uh, the uh, three amendments so far. And the last one, Mr. Loretti, you're up for your substitute motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, before I discuss this motion, I must give credit where it is due. The language in my proposed bylaw change comes directly from the City of Boston picketing ordinance. I simply changed the wording to make it apply to Arlington and removed a couple lines specific to Boston. The key difference between my motion and that of the, in the select board's ban is that mine applies only between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. At other times, nothing changes. I'm making this motion because I believe the select boards goes too far. Theirs would have the effect of banning perfectly peaceful political protest in the middle of the day, including silent ones. Even if constitutional, it, theirs is contrary to the longstanding traditions of free speech and assembly in the Commonwealth. The select board makes much of the fact that their vote uses the exact same language as the ordinance in the Supreme Court Frisbee case which differs from the situation here in a number of ways. First, that case involved Brookfield, Wisconsin, so the greater freedoms afforded by the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights did not apply. Second, it involved the picketing of the home of a, of a private citizen, an abortion doctor, not an elected representative, whose home prompted the select board's proposed change in this case. Both the First Amendment and the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights not only guarantees free speech, they guarantee the right of peaceful assembly to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The, the select board would prohibit such assembly at any time in front of any government representative's home, including the senior most elected official in the state. I have to wonder if they would ban protests in front of the White House if they served on the Washington DC City Council. I hope you've had a chance to read the Frisbee decision on the ordinance the select board wants Arlington to adopt, as well as the dissents to it. I find the latter more compelling. Get well, Charlie. Our team needs you. In Brookfield, Wisconsin, it is unlawful, unlawful for a fifth grader to carry a sign in front of a residence for the period of time necessary to convey its friendly message. message to the intended audience. So wrote the late Justice Stevens in his dissent. The same would be true in Arlington under the select board's vote. While recognizing that the town probably wouldn't seek enforcement against such innocuous picketing, Justice Stevens went on to say, the scope of the ordinance gives the, ta gives the town officials far too much decision discretion in making enforcement decisions. While we sit by and wait, await further developments, Potential picketers must act at their peril. The same would be true here. I was one of two people who spoke at the select board hearing on this article before the board voted on it. No one from the governor's neighborhood showed up to speak, aside from one woman who the board allowed to speak after it had already voted. She described being frightened by the protesters, particularly after one of her neighbors entered her front yard and started yelling at them. Town meeting should be clear that neither the select board recommended vote, my substitute motion, nor any of the amendments will do anything to address her concerns. As the Supreme Court majority wrote about the Wisconsin ordinance, and thus the select board's proposal, 
Protesters have not been barred from the residential neighborhoods. They may enter such neighborhoods alone or in groups, even marching. They may go door to door to proselytize their abuse. They may distribute literature in this manner, in this manager, in this manner or through the mails, end quote. In short, the proposed bylaw will not stop scary people with despicable views, views from entering residential neighborhoods, like the people you just watched in the video. It is only because the ordinance applies just to the targeted home that the Supreme Court was able to find it constitutional. If state or local laws are insufficient to protect the safety of residents, the select board should address those shortcomings directly, not by banning free speech at all hours of the day. And personally, I find it um, a sad commentary on the select board's priorities that they would allow people to be captive in their home to listen to the noise of leaf blowers, but not the voice of political dissent, even silent dissent. I hope. <laughs> Indeed, as the late Justice Brennan wrote about the Frisbee dissent, about Wisconsin protesters trespassing and in one case blocking the exits from a home, surely it is within the government's power to enact regulations as necessary to prevent such intrusive and coercive abuses. Thus, for example, the government could constitutionally regulate the number of residential picketers, the hours during which a residential picket may take place, or the noise level of such a picket. Regulating the hours of targeted picketing is the approach the city of Boston has taken at the initiative of its senior most elected official, Mayor Wu. And it is the approach that I am asking town meeting to take with the senior most elected official in Arlington. But to be honest, I offer this substitute motion to provide town meeting with the option of choosing the lesser of two evils. If you prefer to do no evil, then please to support my substitute motion to prevent the greater evil. And if it comes down to the vinyl vote, please vote the whole thing down. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, do you have a motion to make? Yes, I'd like to move my substitute motion on Article 14. Okay, we have a second. Uh, Mr. Loretti's substitute motion is before us. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Uh, before we dive into the speaker queue, uh, which uh, I'm going to queue up uh, uh, Mr. Diggins and Mr. Mr. Ezra Fisher as the first two speakers from the queue. Uh, however, I did see uh, town council's hand up. He doesn't have a clicker and the select board hearing uh, that he uh, counseled uh, uh, with his legal counsel was mentioned. So Mr. Cunningham, did you want to make a remark briefly? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I just was hoping to be helpful in terms of framing the debate tonight. A couple of issues. Uh, Town Meeting Member Pretzer correctly noted that this must be a content neutral. Anything considered by Town Meeting must be content neutral with regards to application of a, a bylaw. Specifically, um, you know, it's important to, you know, we look at the video that you watched and it's an example of focused and targeted picketing that would be precluded by this proposed bylaw, but picketing conducted by those who may have dramatically different points of view will be subject to this bylaw in the same way as, as the picketing seen in the video. That's, that's critical to survive constitutional analysis. In regard to Mr. Bennell's uh, comments, I do think that we, Mr. Loretti correctly noted that um, the language that, that is before the body of the main motion is taken directly from Frisbee, it's verbatim. Uh, the reason for that is because it's been tested by the United States Supreme Court and the majority opinion decided it was not overly vague and not ambiguous. I think that was something we heard a few times just to help people understand that that was, that was considered by the court. And with regard to the question of whether the proposed bylaw, the same one in Frisbee, is narrowly tailored and thus not vague or overly broad, it was dismissed by the court's majority opinion. Specifically, the court found that the use of the, of the singular form of the words residence and dwelling suggested the, ordi the ordinance is intended, the, our case bylaw, to prohibit only picketing focused on and taking place in front of a particular residence. In fact, the Supreme Court faulted the lower courts for their more broad reading of the language, noting that their endorsed broad reading, quote, ran afoul of the well-established principle that statutes will be interpreted to avoid constitutional difficulties. Our, our statute or bylaw would be interpreted the same way in accordance with Frisbee. The Frisbee court went on to note that to fall within the scope of this bylaw, the ordinance, again bylaw in our case, must be directed at a single residence. I hope that's helpful, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, uh, Mr. Diggins, and then we'll take uh, Mr. Ezra uh, Fisher.
Minor Dickens, Precinct 3. So I'm not going to talk about the main motion because you have my feelings about that from the report. I'm really here to talk about the time limit amendment, but before I get to that, I do want to correct something that Mr. DeCourcy said regarding what I said about being affected by protests here at Town Hall. If I didn't say it in the meeting, in the hearing, Right, yeah, can you speak more into the microphone, Mr. Diggins? Sorry. Or maybe the center microphone? No problem. You know, so here I am. You know, so if I didn't say this in the hearing, what I meant to say was I could come, if there was a protest at Town Hall, I could come in through the front door and only be affected by the protest for a limited amount of time before I went to the chamber, at which point I would be oblivious to the, the protest. So, you know, if that didn't come clear through the meeting, uh, I wanted to make it clear that's how I felt because I'm not going to go through a side door uh, to avoid a protest. You know? But back to the amendment for the time limit. You know, the only reason I'm standing up here is because people may have heard that I supported a time limit, and whereas my colleagues on the select board are used to be changing my mind, uh, some of you probably aren't. You know? But upon thinking about that, amendment. You know, I thought about the example of a vigil, an overnight vigil, and, and I felt that that time limit would affect a vigil. So I am no longer in support of a time limit in, for the um, protest. So I'm not going to tell you how to vote. And it's up to you, but I've said my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Fisher, Ezra Fisher, and uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Bear after that. Uh, Ezra Fisher, Precinct 4. When Nazis come to your town, you respond by supporting your lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender neighbors, working to make town more welcoming to black and brown people, focusing on access for disabled people, affirming that Muslims, Jews, and other religious minorities are seen as equal in all ways. You don't respond by limiting civil rights or liberties. Thanks. All right, let's hold, let's hold the applause. Um, we're gonna hear lots of opinions tonight that you're gonna strongly disagree with and strongly agree with, so let's hold off the applause, please. Uh, Mr., uh, where are we up to? Mr. Bearer, and then we'll take uh, uh, Mr. Oster after that. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. I have a question. If a residence is part of a mixed-use building, for instance, on Mass Ave, and someone wants to picket the store that's underneath them, how is that, how, how do you distinguish between the residence being picketed and the store being picketed? Are you asking about any particular formulation of the motions before us, or in general, like the main motion, or? Uh, the, the main, as particular, the, the main motion main to motion. start. Um, Mr. Cunningham, do you want to address that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Uh, in response, that would depend on some other facts that may exist in that particular scenario, but I think in any mixed use, the Frisbee Court specifically did not address that issue. Uh, I would expect that the court would decide it's probably permissible as long as the, the protest is not directed at a resident. Uh, mixed use or a business address has a diminished le a level of expectation of privacy, so therefore the, it's likely that the right to protest or picket would, it would be protected in that instance. So even though the residents in that building would be captive, according to what was described before? Mr. Cunningham? An essential component is that the protest is directed at the resident, not just the noise itself. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Oster next, and then Mr. Uh, Weinstein after that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Oster, Precinct 16. Um, this is, uh, certainly was a distressing video. Um, there's been a good bit of discussion about this topic in advance of tonight's meeting, and a lot of it has been concerned about the constitutionality of regulating protest. Uh, the uh, uh, discussion was useful because uh, uh, the response makes clear that there really aren't any First Amendment issues. 
The Supreme Court has allowed it, and if that's not authority enough, the town of Brookline is doing it. More broadly, though, I think the inquiry helps us to put the proposal in context. Uh, I can't agree with people who see this as a major civil rights violation. It seems entirely reasonable to say that privacy rights uh, in your own home uh, trump uh, uh, the speech that would be affected by this proposal. However, uh, there's another question that we should all ask ourselves when weighing this article. Not only is it legal and constitutional, uh, but is it wise? And at this time, I think it is not. Hate groups rely on media attention for recruitment and energy. This bylaw would create an opportunity for such groups to engage in low-risk confrontations with authority, all while claiming the mantle of victim, of government repression. The narrative of victimhood is powerful once you introduce government and the police. Let's not contribute to that narrative, at least let's not do that tonight. It's a natural impulse to respond aggressively to hate. And I would never say, oh, let's just ignore them and they'll go away. But Arlington has many ways to answer hate, including our own community vigils and gatherings and meetings in houses of worship, the public policies of this town meeting. A public response can be stronger than a legal one. I'll also say for the record that, at least in my opinion, a time could come when this proposal should win our support. I ask the meeting to consider if we're really there today. I don't think that we are. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Oster. We'll take uh, Mr. Weinstein next, and then uh, Mr. Letter Mr. Loretti already spoke. We'll circle back if we get to the speaker queue to him, and then Mr. Hupp after uh, Mr. Weinstein. Mr. Weinstein? Uh, Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, could you bring up the main motion from the uh, annotated yeah. warrant? Can we bring that up on the screen? Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Town Council, uh, Mr. Cunningham, to come up and ask, uh, answer a few questions that I have yeah. about this. Mr. Cunningham? Thank you very much. Um, the first question I have is, in looking at the motion that we're going to be voting on, what part of it exactly is going to become law? Is it from the part which says vote language, or is it beginning title one? Yeah, can we scroll down so that the tiny vote language text is at the very top? Thank you. Michael Cunningham, Town Council, from title one down. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify what exactly, what portion of this was actually going into uh, our bylaws. My next question is, in terms of the term before and about, what is the exact distance of before and about? Does it have a measurement? It does not. How is it determined? It would be factual based, case by case. By determination. Whom? By whom? Initially by law enforcement, then by the courts. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, in that case, where would it be measured from? For example, when we go to vote uh, at polling places, we know that if we're holding a sign, we can't stand within 100 feet of the doorway to the polling place. Um, if you're entering an abortion clinic, we have a law that prohibits protesters who are against uh, abortion services from being within a certain amount of distance. So who decides what the measurement is? Mr. Cunningham? It's, as with, you know, there is no, all, there's no permanent right to free speech or there's no absolute right to free speech. Free speech can be limited based on time, place, and manner restrictions. This is one of those. It would be, you know, I think it's, as with some First Amendment issues or other constitutional issues, um, such as explicit material or pornography, you don't necessarily know, you can't define it, but you know what, when you see it. So it would depend on somebody targeting a residence. Okay, that's, really that, what, it comes that's down not to. what I'm asking. Uh, what I'm asking is when somebody determines where I can stand and where I can't stand, there's no measurement to it. So is it the police that decide whether or not I'm breaking this law? 
Initially, yes, whether you're okay. targeting a residence. All right. The final part is who decides, given the language that's actually being inserted, not the preamble to it, but the language, who decides whether there was intent to target a particular residence? Who makes that decision? Mr. Cunningham? That's a factual based determination made initially by law enforcement, then, then made by the courts. Okay, thank you, by law enforcement. So, I. Well, the record shows that it, it, law enforcement, but then it's tested by the courts. Is that right? Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. All right. If you, uh, well, you have to go to court to get that tested. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. The point I'm trying to make is the vagueness of the wording of this article. It is extremely vague, and all the definitions, all the enforcement criteria depend on the opinion and the judgment of law enforcement. Um, I have been sickened by the actions of the homophobic, racist, white supremacists who have been noisily demonstrating before or about the governor's residence here in Arlington. But this language that we have here is, has been judged very vague. It's up to law enforcement. There's no uh, specific criteria that we're actually enacting. I think this is a terrible law uh, to vote on and to approve. Um, what it says is that it would be a crime to picket even silently in front of any residence anywhere in our town. It does not, according to the language that we're going to be voted on, it's going to be interpreted in five years by a different group of people. It does not say targeted. The preamble says targeted. The, uh, the title of the article says targeted, but there's no targeting. For example, I live uh, at the corner of, uh, well, I live near the corner of Mass Ave and uh, Park Avenue. There are four corners. There are four retail establishments. Each one has residents and people living above them. For example, one of them is UPS. Let's say that a group of us want to demonstrate in support of labor, uh, 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 labor unions who are fighting for a decent contract with UPS. Because of the residents above the UPS and because of the nature of this very vague language, we could be prohibited from doing that or arrested or found to be in violation of this. Um, I simply want to say that uh, I think there, there have to be better ways. There have to be more uh, specific uh, forms of language to use. Um, I think that uh, each of the amendments uh, makes this language more specific. Um, the substitute motion also goes a long way to addressing the concerns that I have and, and many of you I'm sure have about this. Uh, so I would support uh, and urge you to vote in favor of those, but at the end, I would uh, ask you to uh, vote no on the entire thing. Let's give the select board and town manager and other interested, particip uh, other interested citizens here a chance to think this over and come up with a better solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. I'll take Mr. Hupp and then Ms. Malopchik after that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rob Hupp, Precinct 6. Uh, I'm new to this. All right, so I am going to cite some of the online discussion in addition to what we've had tonight. So here are my thoughts, and they're a little bit more general. I try to speak into the microphone. Yeah. This article was created in response to very specific incidents. However, in the online discussions, supporters have been at pains to say it is agnostic in that regard yet sufficiently broad to include them. 
When others rebutted that his language is overly broad and vague, attempts were made to make it more focused. Many examples and scenarios have been offered by those in favor and by those opposed. Taken collectively, they suggest it remains overly broad and vague. Broad and vague legislation is dangerous. Created in response to incidents of the past, it is open to misuse in the future. Citations to the contrary do not disprove this. As we have all seen, history offers no guarantees. Protest by its nature is designed to make people feel uncomfortable and thereby call attention to something which the protesters feel is wrong or inappropriate. What we may have seen is disgusting, but nonetheless it remains protest. This is not a dictionary description, but a rephrasing of recent commentary in the national press. Protests that are shunted off to remote locations, ostensibly to make people feel safe, usually have little to no impact on either the target of protest or the general population who might learn of the grievance. When a protest, while a protest may threaten one's sensibilities, it should never threaten one's being, one's family, or one's home. When protest escalates into threat, the police should and must be called. Massachusetts has at least one law addressing this. I have a citation, but I won't bore you with it right now. I understand that the proposed article would hope to remove any subjective determination or implication of threat by simply outlawing the activity itself. However, once we start equating protest with implied threat, even location-targeted protest, and begin passing laws treating it as such, we are one step nearer toward outlawing it completely, and dissent is imperiled. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Malopchik, and then we'll take Ms. Dre. Does the clock start again? I'm sorry? Does the clock start again? Uh, I haven't said my name yet, and the clock yeah, is running. Yep, go ahead. Beth Malofchek, Precinct 9. I'm horrified at this um, article that is before us. I will be voting for the amendments and the substitute motion to make it less onerous, and then I will be voting it down. I ask you to seriously consider the same. I'm very impressed at the well thought out and studied um, opinions expressed by my colleagues. Um, I'm, thank you. When we defer to the police department to make these decisions in vague language, we could potentially lose freedom. Unfortunately, our police department in the past, in the recent past, was unable to discern between a white um, criminal or suspect they were looking for in a black pedestrian. I am not willing to rely on their judgment with vague language. I am not willing to let a bunch of Nazis intimidate the select board into chipping away at our rights. April 19th is more than an opportunity for a parade. It's an opportunity for reflection on what it is 250 years ago, people got out of their homes and went and stood up to authority and stood up to power. We have power. We are power. This is the people's meeting. The select board came to us with a suggestion it's not well formed. Where's the study committee? Send it back for further study. Are there really no tools in the toolbox of the police department? And my godfather was an Irish cop in New York City, so I respect the police department. I don't respect bad decisions, and I don't respect bad law, ill-conceived law that chip away at my rights, at your rights. We've watched the Supreme Court of this country take away women's rights and women's access to health care. Unconscionable when those rights were fought, were so hard fought, as our right to vote. How hard fought was that? 
How much picketing did Alice Paul have to do and protesting decades, decades before her? I'm upset. And I thank Len Diggins for his dissent. My father spent four years in the jungle in combat. He was a combat medic in World War II. He lost his brother over France. They sacrificed because the imperfect idea of democracy that we have here and throughout the country is worth defending. I hope all of you will feel as strongly as I do about this and we'll vote for the amendments and the substitute motion and then vote down this article and send it back to the drawing board. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Milovchek. We'll take Ms. Dre next and then Ms. Culverhouse after that. Ms. Dre. Good evening, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. I want to thank Attorney him for being so generous with his time. We had a lengthy phone call today and he answered a lot of my specific questions and I, I appreciate his making himself available to me. I have lingering concerns. Um, several of them were mentioned by Mr. Weinstein about the vagueness of this article. What does before and about mean? What's the distance? Who decides? So I won't repeat that. Also, according to my discussion with Mr. Cunningham, and he's welcome to correct me if I misinterpreted, but the ability to protest an eviction of a multifamily owner-occupied property is unsettled law. Would that? Mr. Cunningham, is that accurate? Yes, thumbs up. Yes. Okay, so that's a concern. That's unsettled. Our current APD is committed to de-escalation it is committed to trying to resolve things without arrest, but we can't count on that for the future. We can't count on the fact that our future chief will have that same approach. And we are potentially passing a law that allows for us to not be allowed to protest. Um, based on the interpretation, the judgment of our police department. Another point I wanted to bring up is that um, the APD, according to the chief's um, comments at the select board hearing, had to wait uh, for backup, wait for the state police to show up. And there is nothing about this bylaw that's gonna guarantee that that doesn't happen again. There's nothing about this bylaw that is guarantees that these protests are gonna end any quicker. We also already have existing laws that can be used in these situations. We have a loitering law. We have a disorderly conduct law. We have failure to obey a lawful order. And we have trespassing. So let's use the laws we have to control the behavior that we don't want here. We are being asked to give away our right to protest because of three events at one location, the governor's house. That is too much to ask. Just because it's constitutional does not mean it's right for Arlington. I have heard a proposal that we should pass it now, see what happens, and if needed, we can come back and change it and rescind it. I caution you on that approach. Once you give power like that to anyone, including the APD, it's going to be very difficult to take it back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dre. Ms. Culverhouse next, and then Mr. Helmuth. Lynette Culverhouse, Precinct 11. 
I also rise up in strong opposition to this article. Throughout the country, there seems to be a troubling move towards censorship and criminalizing protest. I want to remind this meeting, as somebody else also did, that without organizing and protesting, women wouldn't have the vote. And we wouldn't have the civil rights that allowed African Americans to have equal access to all rights. Just two of the major breakthroughs as a result of extensive protest. Similarly, the Vietnam War may have gone on for a lot longer had people throughout the world not pr protested publicly. There's an escalating trend towards militarizing our police and viewing citizens as potential enemies. In a healthy democracy, dissent and protest are essential and indeed are protected by the Constitution. Allowing all voices and perspectives to be heard strengthens us as we navigate the deep divisions within us. We erode our democracy by taking away even the smallest of rights to protest. Most protests that take place in Arlington are peaceful and have no harmful effects. With the rise of fascism and neo-Nazi movements, however, we have on a small handful of occasions been invaded by outsiders who have caused a disturbance. I believe Arlington and the state have laws to protect us on such occasions. If the APD doesn't feel qualified to address these situations, I suggest we might support more training. The rise of extremism might get worse before it gets better. It is not progress to take away everyone's rights because of a handful of bullies. And besides, it is unconstitutional to take away this right. Please help us preserve our de democratic rights and vote no to this article. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Culverhaus. Actually, uh, Mr. Helmuth, let's, uh, let's take a, I imagine we might have a number of more speakers. Uh, it's almost 9.30, so let's take a 10-minute recess. Uh, it will it'll be a strict 10 minutes, and we'll come back and resume. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. We're getting started here. So before we resume this, uh, the speaker queue on Article 14, uh, there were some requests, there were some new town meeting members with us tonight uh, who had, have not had a chance to uh, be sworn in. So we're going to bring up the oath right now and do that. So their first act is town meeting members can vote on this article before us. So can we, okay, we have the oath here. So if you need to be sworn in, please rise and repeat after me. I state your name, will participate fully and will fairly evaluate all matters before town meeting and vote in the best interests of the town. I support free speech. <laughs> all right, all right, come on. And will treat others with mutual respect and will conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member. Of the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws. The Town Manager Act and the general laws of the Commonwealth. So help me God. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, and let's see, and Mr. Helmuth, you're up. And after Mr. Helmuth will be Mr. Granucci. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12, and I am speaking in my individual role as a town meeting member. 
I stand here tonight as a member of the queer community whose fundamental rights to equal treatment, including the right to marry, were won by the exercise of the First Amendment, including, but not certainly limited to, the right to protest. I, of all people, do not take this matter lightly. Free speech is a precious right, but it has never been an unlimited right. The question is where we set the limits. We have always balanced it against other rights, and one of the most important rights, and one of the most important personal rights to me is the right to privacy, and the right to residential privacy. That is also a bedrock that protects many of us. We have a responsibility to balance that right with the First Amendment. It's what we've always done. I don't think it is accurate to look at this conversation only in the terms of limiting just one of our constitutional rights. Those rights notwithstanding, in a sense, elected officials sign up for some of this. We should listen. People do have the right to protest what we do. But our families, our children, and our neighbors don't sign up for this. Even if protests are silent, children and other family members of the elected official are compelled to witness the speech, even if that speech is obscene, defamatory, or upsetting. Because it's at their home. And they have no other ability to be anywhere else but at their home at the time. I don't believe this would take away our right to protest. There are many avenues to exercise free speech, to petition, to criticize, to insult elected officials. In the case of the governor at the State House, there are regular, loud, sometimes unpleasant protests right outside the governor's office. This happens regularly. The governor's public schedule is well known. Protests happen at public events regularly if they want to. People can demonstrate and protest in almost every public space, but the tactic of targeting people in their homes has a long and ugly history in this country, and we are seeing that again. We should be able to afford some basic protections against that intimidation and the confidence that the, it only incurs limited restrictions to the First Amendment. It's a balance. Federal and state courts have consistently held that restrictions in front of a private residence is reasonable and limited, that it balances free speech rights with the right to residential privacy, a precious right. In reality, this is a limited, narrow restriction. By its very definition, it cannot be a slippery slope to restrictions elsewhere. That is very, very clear in Supreme Court decision and other courts, court decisions. If it were a slippery slope, I of all people would never support this. The restrictions are limited. The cost to the First Amendment is low. But the benefit to the right of the individuals in those homes, especially the children, especially the neighbors, especially the spouses and partners, is significant. It's a balance. On its face, the wording of the law may look broad and vague. Attorney Cunningham, Mr. DeCourcy have explained why it really isn't. It's all in the interpretation and the application of that law by the courts. You can ask them additional questions, and I encourage you to do so if that is your concern, that this would allow the police or the town of Arlington or the select board or anybody else to further infringe our precious right to protest. We cannot limit this just to silent protests, just to holding signs, as much as that might seem like it would solve the problem that we saw in the video, because it is not content neutral. It would not be constitutional. The language was actually carefully crafted, it was carefully crafted not only to stand up in court, but to allow the time to, town to do the right thing, but to not do more than it has to do. If we give the town tools, it doesn't have now. The police don't have the authority to interpret this too broadly. 
I don't believe our current police chief of all people would allow that. I don't believe our officers would do it. And I think if a future police department and a future police chief did, there are safeguards that I trust. Simply imposing time limits doesn't solve the problem that the people who live in those homes and their neighbors cannot afford, cannot avoid the compelled listening or the observation of the speech, however uncivil, offensive, or frightening it may be. This bylaw would give us specific tools that we don't have now to deal with situations like this. It is not a perfect tool. It would not prevent marches in the neighborhood. And I encourage you, by the way, to ask the town attorney, ask the police chief, if you have specific questions about how town officials would use this, they're here for you. You can ask them. You don't have to rely on, I think, some, some fears that I not only understand, I, I resonate and agree with for my own liberties. Um, but you can ask them what, why we need this. You can ask them what this does that we don't have the ability to do now. Um, they're there for you if you want to ask those questions. So it's not a perfect tool, but it is more than we have now. I believe it will help, and I would respectfully ask you to consider supporting it. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, uh, Mr. Grinucci next, and then we'll take Mr. Andrew Fisher after that. Thank you. Carmine Granucci, Precinct 21. I move to terminate debate in all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 14 and all matters before it say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. Uh, debate continues. Mr. Andrew Fisher next. Oh, we have uh, three, four, five. Okay, uh, we'll take an electronic vote. Uh, this will be a two thirds vote for termination of debate. When the green light comes on, uh, voting will be open. It's not open yet. So get your handsets ready. And we will preserve the speaker queue, correct? Yes. So um, the light is on, so you can vote one if you wish to terminate debate. Press two if you wish to continue debate. So you have 15 seconds to get your vote registered. So you can check your handset display to see if uh, it has been confirmed. Five seconds, and we'll close voting. This is a two-thirds vote. Okay, voting is closed. And it fails. 140 in the affirmative, 80 in the negative. Um, I think we can show percentages. I think it's, yeah, just show that quickly. We can flip over to a percentage. 62%. Uh, you need to achieve 66 and two-thirds percent. Uh, so the next speaker, Mr. Andrew Fisher, please. Yeah, can we switch over to the speaker queue as the next speaker comes up? Mr. Andrew Fisher, are you at a microphone? Here he comes. Oh, and the next speaker after that will be uh, Mr. Newton. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fisher, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I would urge a yes vote on this article as amended by Mr. Bunnell's amendment. Is this just an echo or does it sound okay? Thank you. Uh, so it reads, it is unlawful for any person to engage in picketing that, that focused on and taking place before or about the residence or dwelling of any individual in the town of Arlington. I will also recommend an expectation that the police advisory committee will work with the police and with demonstrators affected by this bylaw whenever they can be contacted to monitor and report back how this bylaw is performing. Brookline did this. And I say with confidence that if there is a need to amend or repeal this bylaw, we shall be so informed and take action. My talk's gonna tell snippets of stories about Swampscott, Boston, and Arlington, mainly Swampscott and Brookline, and, and Boston, because we know Arlington. My first example is from a 2021 piece from WGBH. 
describing events in Swampscott that occurred during 2020 and 2021. These are quotes. There are the regular ongoing visits from Diana Ploss, who refers to Black Lives Matter as burn, loot, murder, and diversity as diverse, and I don't want to repeat, uh, quote, these gatherings are a recurring political migraine from, for Baker and his neighbors, but they're also taking a toll on Swampscott as a whole. And Mr. Fisher, can you maybe step away from the microphone a little bit? Um, it's getting Thank a little you. muffled. Uh, we've been in town administer, town administrator Sean Fitzgerald said, we've been in constant conversation with town council looking at what are our legal remedies. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to prevent speech, nor do I think any of us would want to. The lack of recourse is especially dismaying to Tammy Faye Manid one of just a few Swampscott residents of color. Manita has been targeted by Diana Ploss. Manita said, she has mentioned me by name, called me out in terms of wondering why I moved from Roxbury to Swampscott. I thought to myself, maybe this will pass, but it didn't. As a result, Manita says, the simple act of leaving her home has become harrowing. It's a little scary going out, particularly with my son. In addition to this story from Swampscott, we have Mayor Wu's experience and her neighborhood from the February 28, 22, Boston.com, quote, for the last nine weeks, Wu has been the target of protesters. Acknowledging the rights to free speech, Wu said, we want to ensure there are as many avenues as possible to help support our democratic process and be involved and speak your views. But when the goal becomes less about speaking, and more about repeatedly taking away a community's sleep every single day at 7 a.m. just to ensure that you can try to verge on breaking the will of that community. That is harassment, and Boston is better than that. I hope my neighbors will forgive me at some point, Wu said at the time. So we have Swamp Scott 2020 and 2021 Mayor Wu's house and neighborhood in 2022. And in Arlington, we had October 23 and February 24. What impresses me is that we're hearing the same story repeated in three communities over four years. Unwanted speech forced on unwilling listeners inside their homes and local experts in each town saying they need a better law with which to deescalate such targeted protests. This is why I give more weight in this situation to the rights of privacy in the home compared to the rights of strangers to target one home. Now, I want to address the charge that this bylaw can be abused to prevent all free speech in Arlington, because in practice, speech will only be affected if it is focused on one home. If it hadn't worked in Brookline, we would have heard about it in thousands of decibels. So this is a paste from the, the Frisbee case. Uh, Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor speak, speaking. General marching through residential neighborhoods or even walking a route in front of an entire block of houses is not prohibited by this ordinance. Only focused picketing taking place solely in front of a particular residence is prohibited. This is absolutely clear. You don't need a measuring tape to see if someone's focusing on one home. And to say, oh, what if they claim it's three? Well, yeah, three, one of them is that one. It, it becomes picayune. The other thing I wanna dwell on is if this bylaw in its 35 years of existence had caused such problems, the ACLU would be all over it. I made an earnest attempt to contact the ACLU in, in Wisconsin, our office here, New York. If there were problems, they would have got back to me. And I had an in with the national office. Um, scour the website, I invite you to scour the website. You'll find the ACLU using this bylaw to support in, in, in amicus 
uh, briefs. And you'll find one article in which they do say that they do oppose this article. But in that article, they're urging Providence, sorry, um, the city of Providence to use the bylaw, which they have on the books, uh, to 15, defend, 15 seconds. Uh, to defend a, uh, a sex offender who was being badgered in his home. So, I mean, if the ACLU has a, a grasp on it that's, so that shows both sides, I think it's a safe bet to use this bylaw. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Ms. Bergman and then uh, Mr. Moore. Good evening. Robin Bergman, Precinct 12. Um, I have no love for white supremacists, neo-Nazis, as someone who lost a lot of my family in the Holocaust and in Auschwitz. However, I do worry about the broad language of this warrant article. I feel it's way too broad and too vague, as many of my colleagues have already expressed brilliantly before me. I also want to remind people that next Saturday is the 54th anniversary of the Kent State Massacre. Um, I'd like to read, oh, one, one other comment, which is, I feel the problem, some of the problems with this article is that the problem isn't the picketing. The problem is the behavior. And this warrant article does nothing to, do, to deal with that. We already have laws on the books to deal with the behaviors. Um, I don't feel that limiting all free speech picketing is the right way to go. I don't think we should be taking away our rights at this precarious moment. Um, I'd like to read a letter, which I did post to the annotated warrant, from um, Professor Spencer Piston, who's an Arlington resident on Highland Avenue, and a professor at Boston University, political scientist, and he's currently on leave visiting the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard. And it's really tiny, so bear with me here. To the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, I am a resident of Arlington, Highland Avenue, and a professor of political science at Boston University. I study American politics, particularly race, class, and policing, which is of direct relevance to the issue I write about today. I strongly oppose a proposed Article 14 to illegalize picketing in front of or about a specific residence in Arlington. As I write, the conditions of acceptable protest are narrowing across the nation. In some places, it is illegal to write, quote, Black Lives Matter, unquote, on the sidewalk. A series of states have illegalized oil pipeline protests in recent years after the historic resistance at Standing Rock. In other localities, all protests have been de facto banned, as all protests require permits, and local government refused to grant any permits. Here in the greater Boston area, student protests that do not go through a labyrinthian set of processes and procedures to request permission are considered property crimes, trespassing. Local police have brutalized student protesters sitting peacefully in tents. This proposal would do more of the same. Restrictions on protest are restrictions on democracy. The proposal is also vaguely worded. How would tenants getting evicted by a slumlord protest their landlord if they lived on the same property as the landlord. Nearly all protest takes place near a residence. The opportunities for this proposal to be weaponized are immense. The fact that Arlington police approve of the proposal should be a warning sign. They may well support it because it expands their power to regulate people. It was not all too long ago that Arlington residents protested the police killing of George Floyd in our city's streets. If this proposal had been passed prior to 2020, what guarantee do we have that it would not have been used against the protesters? 
Please feel free to contact me with any questions. Sincerely, Spencer Piston. So I will be voting for some of the amendments to make it less bad, but then voting down the whole thing. Thank you. And I hope you'll do the same. Thank you, Ms. Bergen. Uh, Mr. Moore. And then we'll take uh, Mr. Hartshorn. Then Mr. Prokosh. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. I'd like to uh, see if we could get some answers to some of the questions that have been raised in the debate so far. Uh, first, about whether there are other laws uh, that might be utilized to prevent some of the behavior that we observed. For instance, laws against loitering or disorderly contact, conduct or trespassing. Uh, could someone explain why it is uh, existing laws like those uh, are not sufficient to address this sort of behavior? Mr. Cunningham? Do you have Oh, Chief Flaherty? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Um, so what this bylaw would do would really provide clarity for the officers who are responding to these protests. I heard people talk about um, different crimes that the protesters could be charged with one being disturbing the peace, one disorderly conduct. And I just wanted to talk a second about the elements of disturbing the peace. For one to be arrested or taken into custody for disturbing the peace, someone must engage in conduct that most people would find unreasonably disruptive. The actions have to be intentional, and the offender must, in fact, disturb at least one person's speech. So the Allington Police Department responded to all of the protests that happened um, in, the, in the recent months, and um, we received many 911 calls. All of those calls, um, we heard from people that were in fear. Most of those people did not want to share their identity because they were afraid to leave their identity. That every, every time somebody calls 911, that's a public record. They're afraid to leave their identity because they're afraid of the protesters finding out who they were. Disorderly conduct. In order for someone to be charged with disorderly conduct, they must engage in fighting or threatening behavior or engage in violent or tumultuous behavior or create a hazard or physically offensive condition that serves no legitimate purpose. The Massachusetts courts have ruled that political protests have a legitimate purpose, so that wouldn't be an option for us. Thank you. So it seems like we don't have quite the tools we think we'd like to have. Uh, to my layman's eye, that looked pretty disorderly. Um, but apparently it doesn't quite satisfy the law, which is why we need to be talking about this one. One of the things that I was concerned about with the text is the term focused doesn't actually appear in the text. It appears in the title. So it looks like we're saying you can't pick it before or about a residence. If I were to stand with my campaign sign before or about Mr. Helmuth's house advertising my candidacy for town meeting, um, would that be a problem? Uh, Mr. Cunningham, do you have an opinion on that? Michael Cunningham, town council, not unless it was directed at the residents and That's the occupants therein. Kind of directed at me, if it's my campaign, right? It's, it can't, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> All right. Um, so it looks like we have a fairly focused bylaw here. The text looks a little bit broad, but part of the thing that is restricting its application is the Frisbee decision that defines what all of this means and makes the focused and um, before or about all one test together with an and. Um, I agree uh, with the Bunnell Amendment that it makes sense to actually change the word and make it and. Um, but I think the other amendments make life more complicated and also reduce the effectiveness of this bylaw. I don't actually expect it to be enough to stop all terrible, horrible people from coming to our town and saying terrible, horrible things. That's what we should expect them to do. Sometimes they're gonna show up in the center. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But I do think the balance 
of um, preventing this kind of speech that affects other people, particularly the families of those targeted as well as the neighbors, makes a lot of sense. So this is limited, it's balanced, might not be enough, but let's start small. So I would support the Banal Amendment and urge you to support the article as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And, Mr. and before, uh, uh, is, is this Mr. Prokosh? Before Mr. Prokosh speaks, I, I just want to point out, and uh, I'm not engaging in debate here. Uh, I don't get a clicker. I don't get to vote. I just want to point out, do you see the speaker queue here? Uh, I just want to share with the meeting that I did speak to a resident earlier today, uh, verified that this was a resident who lived on the street in question where there's been some protests and uh, decided not to speak tonight uh, for fear uh, for her family's safety. So I just wanted the meeting to be informed of that information that I had. Mr. Prokosh. Arthur Prokosh, Precinct 4. I move to terminate debate. On this issue and all, all before it. Yeah. Uh, so we have a motion to terminate debate uh, on Article 14 and all matters before it. All those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. no. Motion passes. <laughs> Seeing no challenges, debate is terminated. So we will first take, uh, can we bring up uh, Mr. Bennell's amendment? Hopefully some, everyone has a copy of that, either digitally or on paper. And this will be, so we will vote the amendment, or we vote the motions in this order. First, it'll be the Bennell Amendment, then the Pretzer Amendment, the Lewicki Amendment, the Loretti Substitute, and then finally the main motion, which may or may not be amended or substituted. So we will start with uh, the Bennell Amendment. And to review very briefly, the Bennell Amendment uh, it kind of doesn't make sense to read it out of context, but it changed the word or to an and, uh, so you'd have to look at your copy of it for that to make much sense. And it inserts in the, in the actual bylaw text, uh, focused on and taking place. Um, okay, so let's bring up a vote now on, oh, you can see here on the screen. So let's take up a vote now on the Bunnell Amendment. Okay, voting is now open. If you are in favor of the Bunnell Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, we have 10 seconds left on voting. Five seconds. And voting is closed. Let's show the vote. And it passes, 187 in the affirmative, 39 in the negative, two abstentions. Uh, so the main motion is now amended by the Bunnell Amendment. That, and that's what's the main motion now. Uh, we will now move on to the Pretzer Amendment. And the Pretzer Amendment inserts, or, uh, inserts the text uh, between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. So it's adding a time restriction overnight from not 9 at night to 9 in the morning, uh, during which this uh, uh, prohibition would apply. Okay, so let's bring up a vote now on the Pretzer Amendment. And so we're voting on whether the Pretzer Amendment will amend the main motion that's already been amended by the Bunnell Amendment. So voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Pretzer Amendment, amending the main motion further, press one for yes. If you're opposed to the Pretzer Amendment, you do not want the time, the, 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 the time scope in there, uh, press two for no. So that the prohibition applies around the clock. Okay. Voting is closed. And it passes, 132 in the affirmative, 95 in the negative. Uh, let's uh, move on to uh, let's see, the Lewicki Amendment. So the main motion is now amended by both the, uh, the, the Bunnell Amendment and the Pretzer Amendment. And now we're, um, in the Lewicki Amendment, we're adding the text um, 
This will not apply if the person engaged in picketing resides at the residence or dwelling or has been invited to engage in picketing by a resident of that residence or dwelling uh, after the first sentence. Okay. So let's bring up voting now. This is the Lewicki Amendment. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Lewicki Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay. 10 seconds to get your votes in. Five seconds. And voting is closed. Let's show the vote. And the motion passes, 124 in the affirmative, 90 in the negative, 13 abstentions. So the main motion is now amended by all three amendments. And that takes us now to the Loretti substitute motion. So I'm not gonna recite the whole thing, but if we could just show that briefly on the screen. Um, everyone should be looking at your own digital or paper copy for all the details. Um, then we need the Loretti Amendment, there it is. So this is the Loretti substitute motion. We have a point of order, Ms. Bergman. Point of order, could you just go through the main motion with the amendments first so we know what we're voting to substitute for and explain how that's gonna work? Thank you. Yeah, so, Okay, we can try to do that quickly. Uh, I don't have a copy of all of them uh, uh, applied together, but if we start with the, uh, the recommended vote from the select board, the text was, uh, it was adding Title I, Article 26, focused resident, residential picketing, uh, it is unlawful for any person to engage in picketing before or about the residence or dwelling of any individual in the town of Arlington. The Benell Amendment uh, changes an or to an and and then inserts, it is unlawful for any person to engage in picketing focused on and taking place. Focused on and taking place is uh, inserted by the Benell Amendment before or about any residence or dwelling in the town of Arlington. The Pretzer Amendment then adds on to that between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. So it only applies essentially overnight. Uh, and then finally, the Lewicki Amendment adds to that, this will not apply if the person engaged in picketing resides at the residence or dwelling or has been invited to engage in picketing by a resident of that residence or dwelling. And so all that together is the current main motion. And so the question before the meeting now is whether the meeting wishes to substitute Mr. Loretti's motion, substitute motion in place of that triply amended main motion. And it would wipe the whole thing out and replace it wholesale with the Loretti substitute motion. Point of order. Point of order. Hi there, Gary Goldsmith, Precinct 11. Would it be possible to summarize uh, how the Loretti uh, uh, substitution actually changes the, uh, the original? Um, that would be difficult to do because the text does not align. Uh, it'd be difficult to do a semantic diff on the two. Um, uh, I mean, you have the, the, the plain text before you, so... Um, uh, yeah, we haven't prepared like a side-by-side -side of all the possibilities here, unfortunately. Um, and uh, yeah, can, can we, do we have that on screen right now? That already, can we uh, scroll up a bit and take, uh, hopefully folks have already digested the Loretti Amendment in advance and all the, other, the amendments in advance. So it's basically it's the recommended vote plus all those amendments all together. And now the question is, do we want to substitute that combination of all of those amendments on the main motion with the substitute motion. Mr. Rilardi, do you have a point of order? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, um, Precinct 7. I guess in the, in the interest of uh, full transparency, 
um, and I won't try to explain this myself, but could you ask town council what the difference is in the financial penalty under the main motion as amended and mine as it's shown on the screen? Because I believe that's the only difference right now. Well, that, that would be, I think, returning to debate, and debate has been terminated, but I will say this, that in conversations I've had with town council, violations of the town bylaws by default uh, uh, have a $20 fine. It, folks probably didn't read the entire town bylaws in preparation for Article 14. So. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's bring up a vote on the Loretti, the, the Loretti substitute motion. And so the question is, uh, if, if you wish to substitute, voting has, no, there it is, voting is now open. If you wish to substitute the Loretti motion in place of the three times amended main motion, press one for yes. If you want to leave the main motion with those three amendments applied on the recommended vote of the select board, press two for no to leave that in place and pre press three to abstain. Okay, voting is now closed. And these are all majority votes for amendments and substitute motions. And the computer's thinking. And the motion fails, 77 in the affirmative, 139 in the negative and eight abstentions. So the main motion is still the recommended vote of the select board amended by the three amendments. And that is now our main motion. We will now take a vote on the main motion as amended. So let's bring up a vote for the main motion as amended under Article 14. Okay. So if you wish to accept the main motion and amend the town bylaws according to the recommended vote of the select board, plus the three amendments that we just applied to it, press one for yes. If you wish to leave the town bylaws intact, press two for no. And press three if you wish to abstain. Okay, let's leave voting open for maybe five more seconds. Okay, let's close voting. Um, voting's closed, right? We're starting over? Okay, 10 seconds, okay. So is voting still actually open? There we go, lights back on, okay. Last chance, three seconds. Okay, voting is now really closed. Okay, and the motion fails. 87 in the affirmative, 142 in the negative, and zero abstentions. So the, the, town, law, uh, the town bylaws remain intact under Article 14. Uh, that brings us to Article 15. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy, do you wanna introduce this for us? Okay, let's settle down. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the select board voted five to zero to support favorable action on a new bylaw to prohibit the fair trade of fur products. I understand the proponent will be making a presentation to town meeting. Okay, uh, could we bring, I believe Ms. Dre has a presentation. Can we bring up her presentation, please? And actually, before we do that, can we show and clear the speaker queue before we start the presentation? Okay, uh, speaker queue is about to get cleared. Get ready with your handsets. It is now open and clear. Okay, uh, and now if we can s switch back to the presentation. Can we switch to the presentation, please? There we go. Uh, Ms. Dre, you have the floor. Thank you, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. Arlington is a leader in passing local and state laws that support animal, environmental, and human health. And I'm here to ask town meeting to continue that proud tradition by voting to prohibit the sale of new fur in Arlington. Slide two, please. To begin, I'd like to clarify a few things to get us all on the same page. What is fur? Fur is any animal skin or part thereof with hair, fleece, or fur fibers attached thereto, either in raw or processed state. Next slide, please. What is it that this bylaw will and will not prohibit? 
so please take a look at the slides, but it will prohibit the sale of new finished fur products from animals raised in fur farms or trapped and killed only for their pelts. It does not prohibit the sale of leather, sheepskin, cowhide, fur used for Native American tribal purposes or religious purposes, used fur or fur sold secondhand, and it does not affect hunting or taxidermy. Next slide, please. After speaking to folks in all the retail stores in Arlington, I'm proud to say that we found that none currently sell fur products. Kaylee Yorenka, who is owner of the local business, Yes, was one of the many business owners who supported this warrant article. And she says, her full quote's on the slide, but to summarize, that she's in complete support of this warrant article and adds, I also am proud to be part of a town that prioritizes humane treatment of animals and reducing the negative environmental impact we have in our community. There is only one resale store in town, Buzzy's Bazaar, and it will not be affected by this bylaw. There are times when doing the right thing can adversely affect existing businesses, but fortunately, this is not one of them. This bylaw will have no negative effect on any current Arlington businesses. So you may wonder, what is the point of restricting fur in a town that doesn't sell fur? And I'd say that this is the best time to do it. It's proactive, it's preventative, and it does not negatively affect any of our businesses. We cannot stop our cool industry until we stop the demand for their products. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, Arlington has a consistent local and statewide voting record that demonstrates our commitment to animal welfare. As you'll see on the slide, the majority of Arlingtonians voted to support these animal welfare laws. I'm not going to read them, but you can, you can read them for yourself. Next slide, please. I wanted to just uh, insert a content warning. The next slides contain some images of animal cruelty, which is what the fur industry is all about. Next slide, please. So the fur industry is extremely cruel to animals and completely unnecessary. The vast majority of fur sold in America comes from fur farms where animals spend their entire lives in small cramped cages unable to move. And when it's time for them to be slaughtered, fur farmers will often use the cheapest method possible to preserve the pelt, including electrocution, gas, suffocation, poison, and even live skinning. Next slide, please. And it isn't only wildlife that suffer. Our family dogs and cats do as well. In Massachusetts, Salisbury, Massachusetts, the cat named August was found with a leg trap clamped on his body that gripped tighter and tighter the more the owner tried to remove it. Leg hold traps crush bone, muscle fiber, tendons, and connective tissue, often resulting in amputation and death. I'm sure many of you remember the two illegally leg-trapped foxes that were caught last, that were uh, trapped last year. One fox was caught and able to have his life saved because they amputated his leg. It's unclear what happened to the second fox. Animals often die slow, painful deaths from shock, injury, blood loss, and predation. Next slide, please. The fur industry also takes a huge toll on the environment and turns, and this runs counter to Arlington's local voting record that supports sustainable environmental and climate issues. Again, this slide shows several of these recent votes, and I'm not gonna read them, but there they are. Next slide, please. Fur farms consistently violate environmental regulations. Fur tanning and dressing use carcinogenic toxins such as chromium and formaldehyde to prevent the skin from decaying. These toxins, as well as manure and carcasses, get thrown into wetlands and seep into watersheds. Next slide. Studies by the Independent Environmental Sustainable Group, CE Delft, have shown that fur is the highest offending textile, natural or synthetic, with the worst impact per pound in 17 of the 18 environmental categories considered, including climate change, waste runoff, and toxicity. The climate change impact of mink fur is at least six times higher than faux fur. 
We cannot justify the harm the fur industry does to the environment when we have numerous eco-friendly faux fur options. Next. Fur farming affects the health of humans as well. Since eight, April 2020, COVID outbreaks have affected more than 450 mink farms, including 16 here in the United States, and resulting in the slaughter of over 20 million animals. Scientists are concerned with human contagion may mutate the viruses and decrease vaccine efficacy. Next, please. This warrant article is supported by the MSPCA, Save Arlington Wildlife, the Humane Society of the United States, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and received a unanimous vote of support by our select board. I'd like to thank all of these organizations, as well as Laura Kiesel and Carrie Teal, for their support with this warrant article. The language of this bylaw was approved by the Attorney General, and it was passed in Wellesley in 2020, and since then, Brookline, Weston, Cambridge, Plymouth, and Lexington have passed this bylaw. We don't always have the opportunity to do what's right, but this time we do. By passing this bylaw, we once again write our community values into law, showing that Arlington is a town that is free of cruel practices and supports animal, environmental, and human health. We cannot stop a cruel industry until we stop a demand for their products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dre. Uh, next in the speaker queue is uh, Mr. Cook and then Ms. Crowder. Grant Cook, move the question and all matters associated with it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate under Article 15, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Uh, debate continues. Ms. Crowder? Oh, we have uh, folks standing. Uh, let's take an electronic vote on termination of debate. It's a two-thirds vote. And when the green light goes on, then voting is open. If, you're, if you wish to terminate debate, press one. Uh, if you wish to continue to debate, press two. Or three to abstain. 10 seconds and voting will close. Five seconds to vote. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 160, 166 in the affirmative, uh, 15 negative. Sorry, Ms. Crowder. Uh, debate is terminated. So we will now take a vote on the main motion of Article 15. And this is a majority vote, and uh, an affirmative vote would amend the Title I of the town bylaws to add a new provision to restrict the trade in, the trade-in or sale of new fur products by making it unlawful to sell, offer for sale, trade, or otherwise distribute uh, for monetary or non-monetary consideration of a fur product. So if you're, uh, okay, voting is now open on the main motion. If you are in favor of the main motion, amending the town bylaws in this way, press one for yes. If you're opposed and do not want to change the main motion, uh, change the town bylaws, press two for no, or three to abstain. Voting on the select board's recommended vote of favor, uh, uh, under Article 15. Okay, voting is closing in just a second. Okay, voting is closed. And again, this is a majority vote. And the motion carries. 194 in the affirmative, 18 in the negative, eight abstentions. That takes us to Article 16. I heard a motion to adjourn, I believe from Mr. Gordon. We have a second. All those in favor of adjourning, it is 10.32 p.m. All those in favor of adjourning, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. I think we are not adjourned. Okay, we're going to do it again. Okay, let's go do an electronic vote. This is a majority vote on adjournment. Because in Arlington, we vote on everything. Okay, if you're in favor of generic 50% or adjourning tonight, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no. Okay, voting will close in five seconds. Okay, voting's closed. And motion passes. 
127 in the affirmative, 86 in the negative. We are adjourned. Uh, but before I, before I bang the gavel, do we have any motions to reconsider? Or any notices of reconsideration for anything we voted on tonight? Seeing none, we are adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.